You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. David and I are more or less kind of of the opinion that unions need to shift their PAC funding, which are not union dues, and we need to make that clear, but but we're kind of of the opinion that we need to shift that uh, funding model to organizing and marketing for unions, not for politicians. And so I think that's a really good segue into, like, how do we build power? What happens to our money when we donate it to politicians? We're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. This is the Valley Labor Report. You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison here with my co-host David Story. On the line we have Jonah Furman. He is the author of an excellent newsletter letter about uh, what is happening in today's labor movement called Who Gets the Bird? Uh, you can find it on substack.com. And uh, where we left off, David asked him wh- what he thought uh, it, it's going to take to get mainstream media coverage of the labor movement, and Jonah more or less said, "Well, we need we need a bigger labor movement. We need to be more powerful." And that I think that's a really good segue because David and I, something that we've been talking about on and off the air is how much money unions funnel to Democratic Party PACs and to politicians and things like that. And I want it every time I'm, I say this, I want to make it crystal clear: these are not union dues. These are funds that members voluntarily donate knowing that it will go to politicians so there's a thing about you know i mean they know what's happening with this money it is not a condition of membership in any union across the country but we do we 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 ask our members to donate to these packs and we have do- and unions have donated hundreds of millions of dollars to politicians just across the last 10 years uh, and uh, it, but it, it's also important to point out that not only you know for ours we have the machinist nonpartisan political league not only is that going to campaigns, but it also funds lobbyists. You know, it pays right. for me to go to D.C. Right. and make sure that my members are represented on, on in in D.C. as well. Yeah. So, and you, that's, know, you know, just don't don't think of it as just oh, we're just we're just helping politicians get elected right. because once they get elected, we're holding their feet to mm-hmm. the fire as well, making sure right. that they that they do the promises that they made to us. Yeah, and that that's an, an another. I think that's important, and that's. Um, good, and, but but hundreds of millions of dollars have specifically just gone to campaign yes. donations yes. and and for pol- political campaigns and, and so putting boots on the ground in Georgia. Yeah, and putting boots on the ground in Georgia. And so w- David and I have more or less kind of come to the opinion that w- the labor movement would be better off um, uh, um, within ourselves and electorally. We would be a better electoral force if instead of putting all those money all that money into political campaigns we had invested that in organizing and marketing for the union and putting uh, boots on the ground instead of knocking doors for Warnock and Ossoff we put boots on the ground um, knocking the doors on these Amazon workers where uh, it, 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 on these Amazon workers houses or making calls or, or like meeting people and organizing new shops and things like that and you're an interesting person to get your take on this because you're a political guy you were the labor or you were do, you were asking unions to do this you know for Bernie and AOC more or less and so you know what is what is your kind of take on on unions in the partisan political process how do you feel about that it's a great question i mean i think i would say to back up like there is this idea in the u.s labor movement that like we shouldn't rely on politicians right and sometimes this turns into a strategy saying we shouldn't do political action we should do you know the union should organize at the workplace will grow strong enough that's where the strength is if we build the power there it'll overflow into the rest of society into the rest of politics and things like that. I just want to push back on that because we're starting in a very strange place in this in this story that we're telling about political action and unions, right? So most countries that have, you know, a capitalist society have the industrial revolution more or less around the same time that the US did, give or take some decades, 
they formed labor parties, right? So they had unions of workers who were fighting for something in the workplace. They realized they weren't going to get there with just a fight here against my boss or even here in my industry. We needed something to legislate. You know, the state had to step in on certain issues. And we did that here, right? That's what some of the New Deal era stuff was when we invented a minimum wage, when we invented, you know, limits on working hours, uh, when we, you know, legislated how unions can be formed. So I think we have an American tendency to say this political stuff of giving a bunch of money to politicians has failed, hasn't gotten us anywhere. Unions shouldn't be doing political work. We should be doing organizing work. The answer, which is less satisfying, is we have to do both. But the political system of, of how unions operate is extremely broken. I mean, that is undeniable. 100 percent agree with you. Unions throw money at politicians who really get no return on that in a lot of cases. In the best cases, they play defense, right? They say, well, we denied a majority to the state legislature in this state, so it's not going to go right to work this session. It's very limited, and to call those victories is, you know, you're really lowering the sights of what union political action can be. So I think you're totally right to call out, you know, the, these contributions, whether those contributions would be better off going to organizing. I mean, there's no question we need to invest much more in organizing. Should it come from political contributions? I'm open to it. I don't think those political contributions have gone very far. I will say the work that I did with AOC and Bernie is interesting because for the most part, these are campaigns that do not need union institutional money. We're getting union member money, right? People are given $27 at a time. And if you look at any part of the workforce or any union, there were surveys done, but it looks, you know, basically like the membership is donating to the campaign. So whether the official campaign wants to chip in $1,000 compared to the millions of their members who are just chipping in five bucks, it's really not of concern structurally to the campaign, right? So that's, and, and part of the different model here is that I think because we've come so backwards to political action from our union movement, because for a century the union movement hasn't done anything politically independent of the status quo of the Democratic Party, I mean, and again, to go into this, why this matters is you wouldn't be in a union with your boss, right? So why are you in a party with your boss? Not even as a moral thing, just strategically, it's a problem because when your interests conflict with the interests of your boss, who has more money in the party, you're going to lose that fight, right? So whether it's about we want the minimum wage to go higher, but in my party is someone who would lose money because they own a big company, right, if the minimum wage goes up. So suddenly you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with your boss on political action inside your party, which is just, you know, this is just not a political strategy. But I'll just say, I think these progressive campaigns that have, have kind of cropped up are this interesting backdoor into union political action that is what I've been trying to explore for, you know, over the past year especially, is like, these are poles of attraction for union members. They're excited about these politics, about mm -hmm. Bernie, about AOC, about, they're giving money, we see that. They're knocking doors, they're volunteering all the time. I and mean, that's how I met David, right? Like, mm -hmm. I see this has an energy that the union's political program doesn't have. So can we use these political grassroots movements to find a back door into the union politics and say, here's what the union should be doing, do what Bernie's doing, your members like it, so let's mm -hmm. keep doing that, right? So I think there's there's an interplay here, I totally agree. I mean, you look at some of the spending and it's just uh, not worth what you've paid. Yeah. So, yes. Well, one of the things, and we've got just a few seconds left, but I wanna to touch on that, that point, is one of the things that we really need to do, or that the Democratic Party really needs to do, is come back to the labor movement because what you see with Bernie, like, uh, such as myself and such as yourself, is union members that are actively getting involved and making those calls for him uh, out, 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 out of the love because they see where he's benefited us and where he can benefit us as opposed to most of your liberals in the, in the Democratic okay. Party. Yeah. yeah, we're going to be talking to some more, uh, to Jonah Foreman, some more on the other side. Stay tuned. Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison here with my co-host David Story. On the line, we've got Jonah Furman. He has uh, he has done labor organizing for Bernie Sanders and AOC, uh, and now he has a fantastic, very nerdy labor newsletter about the things happening in the labor movement today. You can find that at whogetsthebird on Substack.com. 
gmail.com. Uh, very good stuff. Very good stuff. We've been talking about the interplay between unions and electoral politics, and I think I think he, I think Jonah, you're making a very kind of smart distinction there. Something that you mentioned that I wanted that. I'm interested in your thoughts on is is that you said that in other countries in, in the Western world there have been created actual quote unquote labor parties, um, whereas we don't have that in the labor move or, or in in America right now we don't have a labor party um, we have the Democratic Party where we've got workers and bosses in the same party, but I mean uh, didn't this uh, hasn't the same thing happened in these other parties when you look at the Labor Party in Britain. I mean, bosses are in the Labor Party in Britain, right? I mean, they, they neo, like, I, I, you know, I haven't, the, the Labor Party in Britain and the Democratic Party in the U.S. And, and, and a lot of these other quote-unquote Labor Parties in the Western world followed more or less the same track as the Democratic Party did. When the Democratic Party was more pro-worker, they were more pro-worker. And when the, the Democratic Party went into the neoliberal decline, they did as well. You know, Tony Blair was uh, uh, just sure. as bad as Bill Clinton, from what I understand. And so is, you know, is the fact that there are parties that are called labor parties in other Western countries, is that really like such an important distinction, you think? I think it is. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. It, it's hard to, you know, the turn to the right in these parties is overdetermined, right? So there's plenty of factors that you can blame it on, and they all happen at once across the Western industrial world. There was recessions that happened on a basically global level. There's the third world debt crisis. There's things that happened that move these parties to the right. But it's not the case to say that the Labor Party in the UK and the Democratic Party in the US are the same. It matters that the Labor Party really was formed as a Labor Party. It was a workers' party that split off from the Liberal Party in the late 1800s, early 1900s in the UK. Yes, they've you know gone further to the right, and Corbyn is like you know Bernie Sanders trying to contest that party's political orientation. But there's first of all structural differences. So things like in the Labor Party, you know, there's actual membership and people have votes, and the unions have votes, and the members of those unions vote on how those unions should operate within the party. So there is a lot more of a mechanism there uh, to control or to be responsive to at least to the membership. But in the U.S., we never had that. And that, you know, there's plenty of re things you could point to to say, why don't we have a real welfare state here? But it's not like the U.K. and the U.S. are the same in terms of yeah. regular mm -hmm. workers and how bad it gets for people and how good it can get for people, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they have a national health system. We have... You know, not nothing, nothing, not in, <laughs> let alone doctors and nurses who are, you know, are employed by the government and mm -hmm. give you free health care. We don't even have we can barely get the government to cover your health care costs if that's, you know, if you need to use health care, which God forbid in this country. So, right. you know, I don't think it's the same to say uh, they've all gone to the right. So they're all the same. I think it's a very different world in which. You know, the first, we use the term PAC, right? The super PAC and PAC. The first political action committee, that was an actual project launched by the CIO, the Congre Congress of Industrial Organizations, in the 30s by John Lewis, who, you know, is the namesake of my newsletter. Th this was a real project, a real moment when labor almost did split off from the Democratic Party. And in a lot of ways, it was the New Deal that kept labor in the Democratic Party. I think if that had happened, you know, now we're talking ancient history, but if that had happened, we'd be talking about a much different political system today, right? You would have a party who sees its interest as advocating for and solely for workers' rights and, you know, the interests of the working class, as opposed to a cross-class collaboration party that, you know, no one can really tell you what the Democratic Party is about. Same with the Republican Party, but certainly not for the Democratic Party. What, you know, what is this party representing? Labor parties, in all their flaws, actually structurally are much more forced to represent the interests of the institutions of workers. They're super flawed. They don't always, you know, the punchline is not what you want to hear all the time. And they're subject to the same forces that, you know, any political party is subject to in terms of the global economy, uh, you know, wars abroad, th things that, that happen to every political party. But I would say, you know, if we had a labor party that was as bad as the Democratic Party, I would still think we're ahead of where we are, because at least you have a structure to intervene in, right? You have something that's a little more clear that you can uh, participate in. It's very unclear how workers are supposed to change the, the, the direction of the Democratic Party today. It's a lot more difficult than a labor party that's just misguided. Hmm. 
I, I, and it's, it's probably important to point out, you know, that you when you when you bring up the New Deal and and the things that happened during that time, it, uh, is the fact that you know uh, a lot of uh, no, no one ever recognizes Eugene Debs running, you know, in the mm-hmm. Socialist Party and pulling the Democratic Party farther left, you know, for. I think it was four four presidential elections, presidential cycles. He ran, and the last time uh, he ran from prison, you know. So there was there was definitely a a pull uh, on the Democratic Party to the left. But also, there's going to be people, especially people that I'm friends with, that are far left that are going to think. And I want to make it very clear. I'm no supporter. When we're talking about a new Labor Party, I'm no supporter of the People's Party as it's trying to be <laughs> done right now. Just I, I mean, I swear to God, somebody on yeah. is going to watch this on YouTube and be like, "Oh, they're they're pimping for the People's Party." Now I have uh, an utmost respect for several of the people that have kind of aligned themselves with that. Uh, uh, Doctor Cornell West being one mm-hmm. of them, but uh, what what some of their lunatical uh, yes. fringe. Uh, followers are doing is insane. So just, yeah. just I wanted to point that out before we got any farther. Yeah, well, so yeah. I, I think that's a that's a good. Pl- you know, what do you? How do you see the mechanism to go forward? You know, and I, I, th- I think you convinced me. I think I, th- I, I think that was. I think Jonah, you're very effective, and uh, you're very effective, effective rhetorically. So what what's the path forward towards getting a more labor oriented political party? Do you yeah. you know? Do you think? Obviously, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is the DSA and like parasitically using the Democratic Party ballot line, and then once they get enough power, then breaking off. But I don't, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? It's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of this conversation is crystal ball stuff, which like yeah. I understand why people want to prognosticate and guess about what the future is going to be and be ready for it. I don't think we know uh, in terms of how this will happen. I do know. I mean, I basically think we're on the right track in terms of contesting this power, and we should have been doing it. You know, I wish that, you know, generations before us had been on this same track. I think the third party thing is a dead end, and it's not, I don't have abstract reasons for that. It's just look at every third party that's ever tried to do it. Look at what Bernie just did if in two presidential runs and essentially created a magnetic pole around which a new movement could be built, and it worked, right? I, it, it, it didn't work. It, it hasn't always worked, but I think you saw dynamics about that the same same type of thing in the 80s with Jesse Jackson's runs in the Democratic Party. And I think that's essentially where we need to go. I, I don't know if that means eventually, you know, it's something besides the Democratic Party that you put on your driver's license at the DMV or if it's, you know, just call the Democratic Party and it's unrecognizable. I don't think that's really that's not really interesting to me because it's just kind of like guesswork, right? But I do think the reason to be in the Democratic Party is the same reason to stay in your union and to be active in your union. Why? It's because this is where working people are collected right now politically Mm -hmm. in the U.S., which is very few places, right? I mean, we are in a society that has social institutions have largely fissured, fallen apart, you know, people, there's the book, you know, Bowling Alone, there's like all these studies of this stuff and people don't do group activity anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly not group activity with any political character and certainly not any political activity with a class character. So unions and the Democratic Party really still are where people of color are are gathered in, you know, super majorities, working class people are gathered in super majorities. There's a lot to be said about the working class people in the Republican Party and especially working class people who don't vote at all. But if you look at the numbers, I mean, there's still millions and millions of workers in the Democratic Party who are going to vote blue because they know that between these two terrible parties, the Democratic Party is, you know, going to occasionally play defense, if not ever play offense. Right. So and the same is true for the unions. Right. We know that the unions, as imperfect as they might be, if I'm upset with my union, whatever it is, it's the only thing that gathers working people together on the basis of being work workers and brings new people in. Right. Because it, when you go to work and there's a union at the workplace, it doesn't matter what your politics are, you suddenly have to think about, do I want to be part of the union? Do I want to be active in the union? Do I want to, you know, build collective power against the interests of my boss? That's an incredibly powerful experience. So in terms of talking about a new ballot line or a new party, I think 
I, I don't know how you look at the past five years and don't feel like we're going in the right direction. That's one of the things that's hard for me to, to look at the, the People's Party stuff and some of the really critical uh, anti-AOC stuff is just mm-hmm. like, look, man, we had there was no left movement 10 years ago in this yep. country to speak of. Now we have millions of regular right. people who know what democratic socialism is, who know what a union is, right? Who right. didn't know it before. So I feel like we want to keep going where the people are. If the people go into a third party, then we should go with them into a third party. I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think there's any reason for us to make plans to do that. I think the people, if you look at exit polls, you look at stats, they're still voting Democrat. They're listening. They want to know, you know, who's going to run against Donald Trump. That's why it was important to be part of that. And I think it's going to be important to keep doing that. We're going to have to have a Democratic Socialist run for president in 2024, whether we think it's a good idea or not, or that's how we want to spend our energy. Like it or not, that's where regular people look at for politics. Same with your union, right? People care about their wages, their health care, bread and butter stuff. Even if you're not interested, it's your job as someone who wants to make change in the world to meet those people where they're at. Where they're at is they're talking about my boss is, you know, is getting on me for coming in two minutes late to work. So you got to fight that fight with them. That's where the fight is because that's where the people are. So that's my take on the on the third party stuff. I think it's a lot of navel gazing for the most part. And yeah. for the most part, just keep going where the people are. And that's the Democratic Party. And you just got to suck it up and get your hands dirty. It's OK. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like they're trying to derail the the yeah. the. The, the good work that's been done through Justice Democrats, through DSA and organizations like that, like you said, where we have seen mm-hmm. them push uh, push the Democratic Party farther left than we've seen in the past uh, in the past Decades. my past last yeah. time, my past lifetime. Mm-hmm. So they're doing good work. We just got to keep supporting them. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. have one more segment with Jonah Furman on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Valley Labor Report. You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. So thanks for tuning in, folks. We appreciate your time. Uh, If you want to see what we're up to throughout the week, get our snide quips about the news of the day, then you should follow us on social media. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Valley Labor Report. We're on Twitter at Labor Reporters. I'm on Twitter at Jacob M underscore A-L. David is on Twitter at Radical Unionist. That's spelled R-A-D-I-C-L Unionist. If you missed part of the show and want to go back and watch it later, you can search YouTube for the Valley Labor Report. Report and subscribe to our channel. You can go back and watch the full show there, and we clip segments throughout the week. That way, if there's just one thing that you were interested in, you can watch that without having to watch the whole show. We do upload the program on more than 11 different podcasting apps. So, to see if we are on your listening platform of choice, you can go to the Valley Labor Report. Transistor. FM slash subscribe. We have a website, the Valley Labor Report. Org. And if you appreciate our work and want to help us stay on the air, consider throwing us a couple dollars a month on patreon.com slash the Valley Labor Report. And one more thing before we get started to the show, the North Alabama DSA has a necessities drive every Saturday at the IBEW Union Hall on Clinton Avenue across from Campus 805 and Yellowhammer Brewing uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, this Saturday and every Saturday. So bring PPE, blankets, clothes, non-perishable food items to the North Alabama DSA's Necessities Necessities Drive this Saturday and every Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. at the IBEW Union Hall on Clinton Avenue. The donations will be sent to the Manor House. 